This is chapter 8, Basic Concepts of Chemical Bonding. Whenever two atoms or ions are strongly held together, we say that there is a chemical bond between them. There are three general types of chemical bonds. The ionic, the covalent, and the metallic. We can get a, a glimpse of these three types of bond by thinking about the simple act of using a stainless steel spoon to add table uh, salt to a glass of water. Table salt is sodium chloride. This one, sodium chloride is right here. Uh, and the structure is held together by ionic bonds, which are due to the electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged ions. The water that is in the glass uh, mainly is H2O molecules. The hydrogen and oxygen atoms, as we can see here, and we mentioned before, the uh, red spheres are oxygen, the white are hydrogens. Uh, those atoms are bonded to one another through covalent bonds, in which molecules are formed by sharing of electrons between atoms. On the other hand, the spoon consists mainly of, of iron metal in which iron atoms are connected to one another via metallic bonds which are formed by electrons that are relatively free to move through the metal. These different substances, sodium chloride, water, and also the iron metal, behave as they do because of the way in which their constituent atoms are connected to one another. For example, sodium chloride readily dissolves in water, but iron metal does not. What determines the types of bonding in any substance? How do the characteristics of these bonds give rise to different physical and chemical properties? The keys to answering the first questions are founded in the electronic structure of the atoms involved, discussed in chapter 6 and 7. In this chapter and the next, we examine the relationship between the electronic structure of atoms and the ionic and covalent chemical bonds that they form. So the learning objectives for this chapters are the at the end of this we're gonna know how to draw structures and we're gonna learn also the octet rule. We'll be able to distinguish between ionic and covalent bonding. Also, we'll be able to use electronegativity values to describe bond polarity. We'll describe also the localized bonding and use resonance structure to represent the localized bonding. Also, we will determine the formal charge on atoms in a covalent structure. And finally, we'll uh, talk about the relative or relate bonds order and also bond length. So let's start by talking about the Lewis symbol. The electrons involved in chemical bonding are the valence electrons, which for most atoms are those in the outermost occupied shell. Here we have a table with the different elements from group one through eight, at least two of them, and their configuration and the Lewis symbol. G. N. Lewis developed a method to denote potentially bonding electrons by using one dot for every valence electrons around the element symbol. So for example, lithium is from family one. That means that lithium has one valence electron. So we can write the um, structure of Lew uh, the Lewis structure or Lewis symbol for lithium as Li and one dot because lithium is from family one as well as sodium. Sodium also is from family one so we can represent sodium, the structure, uh, Lewis structure as Na and the dot. Beryllium is from family two so that's why we can use the symbol of beryllium and two um, electrons in both sides. We can put two in the left, one in the left, another one in the right or one at the top or one in the right, it doesn't matter, but they need to be separate. Magnesium also is from family two, so we can have here the magnesium with the two electrons. Boron, family three, so that means that it has three valence electrons, so that's why we write bottom as a B, and also we can uh, draw three dots, each one representing one of those three valence electrons. Aluminum as well, family three, we can write the Lewis structure by writing AL for aluminum 
and draw three dots around aluminum. It could be in every of the four position. We can write one here, one in the bottom, one here, one, in the, one here, one in the bottom, one in the top, or any other place. So we have four options to draw each of those electrons. For carbon, carbon is family four. So that means that we have four valence electrons. So we need to write those four in each side of the carbon. We have four sides, one top, bottom, right, and left. So we write one electron in each side. The same um, happened with silicon here, Si, and the four electrons. Now, when we get to nitrogen, we have five because nitrogen is a family five. So that means that we write four all around the, the nitrogen, but we need to pair the fifth electron with any of those four electrons that were alone. Okay, so in this case, we can put two electrons here and three uh, some uh, individual electrons in the other side, or we can write the two electrons in the top and one here, one in the bottom, one in the left side. Okay, so the important thing is that we're going to have one pair of electrons and three individual electrons around the symbol, as well as phosphorus, family five. We have uh, um, a lone pair here, and we have three individual electrons around the phosphorus symbol. For oxygen, that is in family number six. We have, in this case, two um, pair of electrons and also two individual electrons. So we can write two of the two pairs on the left, one on the left, another one on the right, and the individual one in the top or in the bottom. Or we can write one individual on the left, the other one in the right, and the two uh, pairs, one top and one in the bottom. So the important thing is that we're going to have six electrons around the oxygen as well as in sulfur. So for also is an element from family six, so that means that it has six ele valence electrons, and we can write that around the symbol of uh, sulfur, that is S. We have two uh, pairs of electrons and two individual electrons. Now, we talk about family seven. Family seven means that we have seven valence electrons, and we can write those electrons around the symbol, in this case F for fluor, and we're going to have three pairs of electrons and one individual electron. Chlorine also from family seven, that means that we have seven valence electrons around the chlor uh, chlorine, so we can put three pairs and one single electron. Or we can you put the single electron on the right side and the lone pair in the left side or whatever we have. At the, at the end, we need to have three uh, pairs of electrons and one individual electron around the symbol of chlorine. And finally, family eight, the family eights are the noble gases. And we know that in that case, we need to write eight electrons around the element, in this case, neon. So we have eight electrons. We have four uh, uh, pairs of electrons. Argon is also family eight. We can write the symbol, structure Lewis symbol as AR. And eight electrons around the argon by using four um, pairs of electrons. So when forming compounds, atoms tend to gain, lose, or share electrons until they are surrounded by eight valence electrons. That is known as the octet rule. So all the atoms want to have eight electrons around them, and that gives a lot of stability. So that's why we have the the noble gases, they have eight electrons, so they don't, they are re reacting, they don't react with other elements. And other elements like fluorine, for example, they have seven electrons, so they love to gain one more, so in that way they will have the octet rule complete. Okay? And for example, sodium, sodium for them is more easy to lose one electron and have the uh, configuration of neon that will complete the octet rule then gain seven electrons. So for that, that's why in family one, as we know, all the elements and atoms from family one, they has a positive one charge as an ion because for them it's really easy to remove that electron. So in that way they can have the configuration of neon that is a noble gas and all the noble gas has the octet. Okay, so that's why it's easy for them to remove one electron. Magnesium and beryllium family two for them is really easy to remove those two electrons that's why family two always going to be plus two because when they do that now they have the uh, configuration of a noble gas
So let's talk now about the ionic formation. Ionic substances generally result from the interaction of metals that are in the left side of the periodic table with nonmetals that we can find them at the right side. Okay, so most of the time, uh, the metals are the ones that like to lose ele uh, electrons, and the nonmetals are the ones that gain electrons. And in that way, basically, they can eventually create that novel configuration or configuration of noble gas. For example, we have, we have sodium here and we have chlorine. These are the loose structure for sodium and for chlorine. Sodium is for family one, so that's why we write Na in one electron. Chlorine is for family seven, so that's why we write three um, pairs of electrons and one single electron. And as we mentioned, in this case, we have a metal and we have a non-metal. So the metals tend to lose that electron. So they release that electron. And chlorine, that is from family seven, they love to gain electrons. Okay, so in that way, now we, are, as, as when we release that uh, electron, now the sodium has a positive one charge. It was neutral before, but because we remove one negative particle, now this the sodium per se is going to have a positive charge, like a cation. And chlorine will receive one extra electron. Here was neutral, but when you receive that negative particle, particle, now you have eight electron. You complete here your octet. So you complete the octet rule. And you're going to be negative one because you gain that electron. Sodium, and also because they lose that electron, they will gain that electronic configuration from the novel gases. And this, that's why we can create those ions and we can have that ionic compound as sodium chloride. So here we have, for example, the sodium as a solid and we have the gas as chlorine. We uh, combine them in this chamber. And at this point, they start to, the sodium start to release. Those electrons are trans being transferred from the sodium to the chlorine gas. And because they transfer that, they are losing those electrons. We start to produce the sodium ions. And also, as well, when chlorine receives those electrons, start to produce the chlorine ion. And eventually, they will form the sodium chloride. Okay, And this basically is known as an exothermic reaction. So let's talk about the energetics of ionic bonding, specifically the Born-Haber cycle. Many factors affect the energy of ionic compounds or ionic bonding. Start with the metal and the nonmetal element. As we saw before, we have the sodium as a solid and the chlorine as a gas. Then we need to make them a gaseous atom. Okay, so the sodium gas will produce, the sodium solid will turn to gas. And then we need to create those ions. And then those ions will combine to produce the sodium chloride. The, the molecule of sodium chlorine, the ionic compound. So this is uh, the Born-Haber cycle for this uh, type of reaction, where we have initially the uh, sodium as a solid and chlorine as a gas. We transform this gas to this, um, this solid to the gas. And at this point, we have the ions produced. This process, all this process absorb energy. So that's why the energy is increasing. But then when you start to combine the ions, you will produce the sodium chloride. And this sodium chloride has a lower energy than the initial reactants. So that means that this process, the whole process, is an exothermic process. You start at this point in energy and you finish at this point in energy. And the total energy of this process uh, for this uh, for production of sodium chloride is 788 kilojoules and this is also associated to the um, lattice energy for sodium chloride okay so for sodium chloride uh, basically this process to produce will um, will release a total of 788 uh, kilojoules per mole and this is also associated to the lattice energy because it's an exothermic, if you're talking about the energy that is released, you will see that it's negative 788 kilojoules. But 
the positive of this value that is 788 kilojoules is the lattice energy the energy that you will need to add to uh, the sodium chloride to separate those ions okay so the formation will release 788 kilojoules that's why as as, as when it released you're going to have a negative a negative um, value but if you want to uh, separate those ions if you start for example with sodium chloride and you want to separate those ions you will need to add 788 kilojoules to separate those ions so we already discussed that making ions ionization energies and electronic affinity remember that the ionization energy is how easy it is to create an ion and in this case how it is to release the electrons so that's why the cations has basically those uh, ionization energy while the nonmetals you talk about the electron affinity because they will like to gain those electrons it takes energy to convert the elements to atoms and then the thermic process it takes energy to create a cation and the thermic process as we saw in the cycle in the past um, slide but energy is released by making the anion and also the formation of the solid release a huge amount of energy being an ex exothermic also reaction so this makes that the formation of the salts from the elements is exothermic as we saw before we, we saw that the um, energy of the sodium chloride is lower as the energy of the reactants so that's why this uh, process to produce sodium chloride is an exothermic kind of reaction. Um, the last energy, as I mentioned in, before, in this case, the, uh, the, that huge exothermic transition is, reversed, is the reverse of the lattice energy. The energy required to completely separate a mole of solid ionic compound into its gaseous ions. So we saw how to, from the gaseous ions, create that solid, and that process was minus 788 kilojoules. But now, if you have the solid ionic compound, and you want to return there to gaseous ions, you need to add 788 um, kilojoules per, per mole for the sodium chloride. The energy associated with the electrostatic interaction is governed by the Columbus law, that uh, electronic uh, electrostatic interaction here is equal to kappa times Q1 and Q2 divided by D. In this equation, Q1 and Q2 are the charges on the particles in Columbus with their sign, and D is the distance between their centers in meters, and kappa is a constant. So basically, this equation indicates that the attractive interaction between two oppositely charged ions increases as the magnitudes of their charges increase and as the distance between their centers decreases. Thus, for a given arrangement of ions, the lattice energy increases as the charges on the ions increases and as their ready decrease. So that's why it's important to understand this Columbus, this Columbus basically gave us that um, relationship between the charges and the distance that they're really important for that lattice energy. So the lattice energy increases with increasing charge on the ions and decreases size of ions. So here we have the lattice energy, as we can see here, lithium, uh, when you combine lithium with fluorine, chlorine, iodine, uh, fluorine is smaller than chlorine, chlorine is smaller than iodine. So as can you, as can you see, that ener lattice energy will increase when that size of the ion is small. The lithium is constant, so it's not making any difference Any difference here. The ones that is changing is the anion. As, as, as you increase the size of that anion, the energy will decrease. So that's why the energy will increase when you will decrease the size and also increasing charge on the ions. As we can see here, we have lithium, we have magnesium. Lithium has a positive one, magnesium a positive two. So that means that we are increasing that charge. And what happened to the lattice energy? Also increase. So the lattice energy will increase 
with an increasing charge of the ions and by decreasing the size of the ions. So let's talk now about the covalent bonds. In covalent bonds, atoms share electrons. Okay, in ionic, they transfer from the metals to the nonmetals. It's a transfer of electrons. That's why you create ions, and that's why it's called an ionic bonding. Here in the covalent bonding, the electrons are shared between those um, atoms. There are several electrostatic interactions in these bonds. Attractions between the electrons and the nuclei. Remember that the electrons is a positive charge because in the nuclei, in, sorry, in the nucleus we have a positive charge because we have there the protons. So that's why you have an attraction between the nuclei and the electrons. Also, you will have repulsion between the electrons. This and this electrons is going to have some kind of repulsion, and also between the nuclei because also they have a highly uh, concentration of positive charge here and also here. There's going to be a tendency also to separate a little bit those nuclei due to the repulsion uh, for the high concentration of positive charges. For a bond to form, the attraction must be greater than the repulsion. For a covalent bond to form, the attraction must be greater than the repulsion. So let's talk about the Lewis structure and see how that this can help us with the covalent bond. Sharing electrons to make covalent bonds can be demonstrated by using the Lewis structures. We start by trying to give each atom the same number of electrons as the nearest noble gas by sharing electrons. Remember that it wants to complete that octet rule. The simplest examples are for hydrogen, H2, and chlorine, Cl2, that we're going to see here in a moment. In the case of hydrogen, we have that hydrogen is from family 1. So that means that each hydrogen is going to give one electron. So here this bond has the two electrons, one from this hydrogen and the other one from this hydrogen. So each bond always are going to have two electrons. In the case of chlorine, chlorine is from family 7. Okay, remember that chlorine is from family 7. So we have here two electrons in this bond. And here we have 2, 4, 6, plus 1 of this is going to be 7. And 2, 4, 6, plus 1 of this, remember that we're going to have 2 here, 1 from here, and 1 from here. We, have, we still have the 7. But now, because they are sharing these two electrons, that means that those two electrons are from this chlorine and also from this chlorine. So now, because we are sharing these two electrons, we have two electrons here. We have two, four, six, and eight. So here we have the octet rule complete, as well as in this chlorine, because we have two, four, six, and this two that has been shared by the two uh, atoms of chlorine complete the octet rule for this chlorine. Okay, so now we have the octet complete here because we have eight electrons around this chlorine, and we also have eight electrons around this chlorine because we are sharing two electrons. So electrons on the Lewis structure, lone pairs, electrons located on only one atom in a Lewis structure. So those are the lone pairs. And the bonding pairs that share electrons in a Lewis structure, they can be represented by dots or one line. So as we saw here, let's go pretty, pretty fast, back, uh, fast back here. We have the, these are the lone pairs electrons, okay? And these are the shared electrons. So these are the lone pair electrons and the shared electrons. In many molecules, atoms attain complete octets by sharing more than one pair of electrons. In this case, we have that some atoms share only one pair of electrons, and these bonds are called single bonds. But when two electrons pairs are shared by two atoms, Two lines are drawn in the Lewis structure, and this will be a double bond. And sometimes, instead of sharing just two uh, pairs of electrons, we're going to have 
uh, atoms that need to share three uh, pairs of electrons so in that way they can complete the octet rule and this is known as a triple bond between those two atoms so here we have an example of uh, carbon dioxide and between this oxygen and this carbon we're sharing two pairs of electron as well as, as from this carbon and this oxygen we can see here that we have two pairs of electron that has been shared between these two atoms once again this arch has been sh is, is shared by these two atoms so we have two four six and eight electrons around this carbon and this carbon has eight electrons shared I mean four electrons shared in this in this side by this oxygen and four here shared with this oxygen so at the, a total of eight electrons around the carbon even though there has is arch uh, is, is shared your the, the carbon is sharing those electrons now here but they are around the carbon so we have eight electrons and that complete the octet rule for this carbon as well for this oxygen we have two lone pairs but also we have four electron that is uh, being shared by the two um, atoms so in that way this oxygen also has the eight uh, octet rule so we can represent this by drawing the two dots between uh, the two pairs dots between the two carbon or also by two lines so that means that each line represent two electrons so here we are sharing four electrons and this this side four electrons so this is an example of double bonds and also we can have for example in nitrogen they, uh, the day between those two atoms they are sharing uh, three uh, pairs of electrons so we have uh, basically what is known as a triple bond so here we have a total of six electrons two electrons for each bond so we have six electrons here and two here around this nitrogen we have eight electrons we have six electrons here a pair here so that means eight so around this nitrogen we have eight electrons so we complete that there the um, octet rules for those two atoms so now let's talk about the polar covalent bonds when two identical atoms bond as chlorine or hydrogen the electron pairs must be shared equally so those electrons are in the middle between those two elements so that is known as a non-polar covalent bond but we have also polar covalent bonds in this way the electrons is in a covalent bond are not always shared equally fluorine pulls harder on the electrons it shares with hydrogen than hydrogen does therefore the fluorine end of the molecule has more electron density than the hydrogen end so here we have, for example, uh, these are um, electron density between uh, in a molecule of fluorine. Both of them has basically they pull the, the same with the, uh, with the same um, force. Okay, those electrons. So those electrons are basically in the middle of the two molecules. They are sharing those two electrons, and they are in the middle. Now, when we put hydrogen and fluorine, fluorine pulls more of those electrons close to the fluorine so that's why you can see here, here a high electron density as compared to the end of the hydrogen so because fluorine can pull more of those electrons you are creating this polarity in this bond this side is more negative this side is more positive and if we you see lithium and fluorine this is an ionic compound we can see here that we have a really positive area here and we have here a high density of electrons with a negative charge in this side in a in an ionic compound okay but this one that is covalent we can see also that we have a higher uh, electron density in this side because fluorine pull more those electrons that still uh, are sharing with the hydrogen okay it's not like they are taking away those hydrogen uh, those electrons from hydrogen no they are still sharing those electrons with hydrogen but they pull those electrons a little bit more uh, than the hydrogen. So that's why you create that polarity in those covalent bonds. So you're going to have also, polar well, not always, but you can have nonpolar covalent bonds and polar covalent bonds.
but you will never have a polar ionic bond because when you have an ion, you're not sharing nothing. You're transferring the whole electrons from the, the metal to the metal. So when you're talking about polar or nonpolar is when you're talking about the covalent bonds. We use a quantity called electronegativity to estimate whether a given bond is nonpolar covalent, a polar covalent, or an ionic. Electronegativity is defined as the ability of an atom in a molecule to attract electrons to itself. The greater an atom's electronegativity, the greater its ability to attract electrons to itself. So, as mentioned, is the ability to attract those electrons. And in the periodic table, there is also a trend. Electronegativity generally increases as you go from the left to the right across a period, and when you go from the bottom to the top in a group. So that means that the highest electronegativity is found in the fluorine. That's the atom that is in the right side and is in the top side of the group. So this fluorine is going to have always the highest electronegativity that is, is established as 4.0. That's the electronegativity of fluorine, the one that has the highest electronegativity. So electronegativity and polar covalent bonds. When two atoms share electrons unequally, a polar covalent bond results. Electrons tend to spend more time around the more electronegativity atom. The result is partial negative charge and is represented by this symbol that is called delta, delta negative. Okay, so that's, that's when you create that uh, polarity in the bond, you're going to identify which which end is negative and which then is positive by using the delta minus or delta plus. The other atom or the other end is going to be the delta po uh, plus, that is the more positive end. So here, we know that fluorine is going to pull all those electrons, both of them, one from hydrogen, one from fluorine, they're going to pull them close to the more to the fluorine so we're going to represent this as delta minus, and the, the uh, hydrogen that is, is feeling that it doesn't have those electrons close to it, so you're going to have a partial positive charge, so it's represented by the delta positive, partial positive, partial negative. Also, another way to represent it is by using an arrow, okay, and the head of the arrow is going to be in the more uh, uh, high-density electron, okay, or the delta uh, minus, and the cross of the arrow is going to be in the more positive end or the delta positive. So here we have the polar covalent bond again. We have a table and we can see here the electronegativity difference between hydrogen and fluorine, hydrogen and chlorine, hydrogen and bromine, hydrogen and iodine, and also the bond length. length. And we can see that the HF has a higher uh, dipole moment. That means that we have uh, a, a partial negative or very high, high partial negative uh, density here and a partial positive, okay? And this has a big dipole moment because one, the electronegativity difference between these two and also because of the bond length that is really small. So HCl is here have a larger uh, anion, the bond length is a little bit longer, okay, and the difference in electronegativity is 0.9, the dipole moment is 1.08, is still being considered a polar uh, covalent bond. HBr also has a, a larger bond length, electronegativity difference of 0.7, dipole moment of 0.82, also considered as a polar covalent bond, as well as the H. I. Polarity helps determine many properties we observe at the macroscopic level in the laboratory and in everyday life. Polar molecules align themselves with respect to one another with the negative end of one molecule and the positive end of another attracting each other.
polar molecules are likewise attracted to ions. The negative end of a polar molecule is attracted to a positive ion, and the positive end is attracted to a negative ion. These interactions account for many properties of liquids, solids, and solutions. How can we quantify the polarity of a molecule? Whenever two electrical charges of equal magnitude but opposed sign are separate by a distance, a dipole is established. The quantitative measure of the magnitude of a dipole is called the dipole moment, represented by the Greek letter mu. If two equal and opposite charge, Q positive and Q negative, are separated by a distance r, the magnitude of the dipole moment is the product of Q times r. So this basically is the expression of the uh, dipole moment. And the dipole moment will increase as the magnitude of the charges increase and also as the distance between them also increase. The larger the dipole moment, the more polar the bone. So how can we determine if a molecule is, or a compound, is ionic or is covalent? Well, we have a few um, hints that could help us to determine what type of compound is. The first one is the simple approach. If you see a metal with an unmetal, you said that it's an ionic. If you uh, see a metal, an unmetal with an unmetal, it's a covalent. Another way also is to determine the difference in electronegativity of the two atoms involved in that bond. And that way we can uh, determine if that molecule could be also uh, ionic or covalent. And the third way also is to look it up for the properties of the compound. Uh, for example, the lower the melting points, that means that uh, that compound is a covalent one. Now, here we're going to learn how to write Lewis structures. And these are just for the covalent molecules. So, First, we need to sum the valence electrons from all atoms, taking into account overall charge. So here we have phosphorus and chlorine. So we have one phosphorus. Phosphor basically uh, is from family 5 and chloride from family 7. So if, if this compound or, or if we have a molecule that is a nanion, we need to add an electron for each negative charge. If it's a cation, we need to subtract one electron for each positive charge. So here we have, as I mentioned, phosphorus from family five, chlorine from family seven, we have three of chlorine, so we multiply seven times three, and because the seven is the family and that represents the valence electrons, okay? And uh, phosphorus is from family five, so it has five valence electrons, so at the end we're gonna have 26 electrons that we need to distribute around the molecule in a way that each of them has the uh, complete the octet rule, okay? And remember that in this case, this is a neutral uh, molecule, but maybe we have a polyatomic anion or cation that we need to determine also uh, the, the, the structure of that, or we want to write the loose structure. Remember that if, that if that ion is an anion, we need then to add one electron here. If it's a cation, we need to subtract, if it's just a cation of a positive one, we need to subtract just one electron. So for each electron that you add, you're going to add uh, a number here. So if you add three electrons, so you may need to add three electrons at the total that you calculate initially for each family. Okay, so if it's a neutral, just follow the group that they are and count just the valence electrons, and that will be all the number of electrons that you need to distribute all around the molecule. So write the symbols for the atoms, show which atoms are attached to which, and connect them in a, with a single bond. So we're going to put first uh, here the phosphorus in the middle because it can create more bonds. If you write the structure for the Lu, for the Lu structure just for phosphorus, you will see that you have an unpair of elect, uh, a pair of electrons, a long pair of electrons, and three unpaired electrons. So those three unpaired can make bonds. You have three possibilities to create bonds. But with chlorine, because it's seven, you will have three lone pairs electrons and one individual electron. So that means that you can just 
create one bond with chlorine. So you're gonna put in the middle the atom that can create more numbers of bonds. So that's why you put phosphorus in the middle. And you're gonna put one bond between them, okay? And each bond represents how many electrons? Each bond, each bond represents two electrons that we mentioned before, okay? So we need to keep track of the electrons. We have 26 at the beginning to start with, and we're gonna subtract six that we use to create those three single bonds, okay? So now we have 20 that we need to distribute all around the molecule. So complete now the octet rules, the octets around all the atoms bonded to the central atom. So here we have two, four, six, and two here, we have eight, two, four, six, and here we have eight, two, four, six, and we have eight also here. So now we added one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine uh, pairs. So that means 18, uh, basically 18 electrons. So we have now 20 minus 18 is going to equal to two. So we have two left so we can add it in the molecule. And we, so we can see here that the phosphorus has just six electrons around it. So we then can place those electrons on the central atom. So in that way, it also completes the octet for that specific atom. So here we just need to look for the uh, valence electrons in a way that we can uh, draw this uh, Lewis structures. And now 2 minus 2 basically is equal to 0, so we use all the elect possible balance, electron, balance electrons uh, to draw this structure. Now, if there are not enough electrons to give the central atom an octet, if you use all the electrons and you still see that the, the central atom is not, it, it doesn't have yet the octet, you need to use multiple bonds. So in this case, we have this H, HCN is a molecule, and this is the initial structure, the loose structure. But we can see here that for hydrogen, remember that hydrogen needs to have just two electrons around it, and that's their, that does, that's their octet, okay? Because this is an exception for the rule, because it doesn't have, it, it, does, it, it just filled that 1s orbital, so it will be okay with just two electrons. So with hydrogen, we just need two, uh, two electrons around it. So we have here that is complete that, octet rule exception. And with nitrogen, we have here eight electrons around, but with carbon, we just have four. So we need to start to create double bonds between the carbon and the nitrogen, multiple bonds. So we can use one of the lone pairs of the nitrogen and create a double bond. Remember that each bond represents two electrons. So we, from these two electrons, we can create one bond between these two atoms. And also with these two electrons, we can create one bond between those two atoms. So now we have one, two, four, six, eight electrons are on carbon. All of them, have, uh, uh, you can see that they are sharing the electrons between those three, two atoms. And here, the nitrogen has six in the triple bond because we have two electrons for each bond plus two here. So now we have the octet around the nitrogen as well as with the carbon. Also, sometimes we need to assign formal charges because we have ions sometimes. So we the formal charge is the charge an atom would have if all the electrons in a covalent bond were shared equally. So formal charge is going to be equal to the valence electrons minus half of the bonding electrons minus all non-bonding electrons. This is one formula. We can create all different kind of formula, but this one is the uh, that's going to give us also the formal charge, but this one is using the valence electrons, the total valence electron minus half of the bonding electrons minus all non-bonding electrons. So what that means? Here we have, for example, for carbon dioxide, writing at, uh, as this way, carbon, double bond, double bond, and oxygen, and oxygen here. Uh, we can see that we have the octet for this oxygen. We have two, four, and here we have four more. Remember that we have two electrons for each bond. So we have eight electrons around this oxygen. Same way with the carbon, we have four bonds around it. So each bond is represented with two electrons. We have eight um, electrons here. And here we have uh, basically also eight electrons. Okay, so we have the octet for each of them. So the valence electrons for oxygen, oxygen is from family six, so it's six. Carbon is from family four, so the valence electron is four. And oxygen 
is also 6. So we have here the valence electrons. Now we need to subtract the electrons assigned atoms. So we have uh, for half of the bonding electrons, we have two from here. Okay, we have four that are doing a, a, a bond, but we're going to use half of them. So instead of four, we're going to use two. Two plus uh, all non minus all non bonding electrons. So non bonding, we have one, two, three, four. That means that four and two is six. So six minus six is zero. For carbon, and this carbon specifically, uh, half of the bonding electrons, we have eight bonding electrons around that carbon, so half of it is four. It's going to be four minus four is going to be equal to zero. And in this oxygen, the same thing is uh, valence electron six, half bonding electrons, we have four bonding electrons, so half is going to be two. And all non bonding electrons, one, two, three, four for this oxygen, so it's going to be four plus two is going to be six, that is this six. So 6 minus 6 is equal to 0. So the formal charge for all these atoms is going to be 0. Now, in this other structure that we can see here is also for carbon dioxide, but it's a little bit different because instead of two double bonds, we're going to have one single bond between this carbon and oxygen and a triple bond between this oxygen and carbon. And even though it's a different arrangement of the electrons, you still have eight electrons around this oxygen. We have two four six and these two are eight so you you have the octet rule with this one and with this carbon you have two four six eight you have also eight electrons are this carbon remember each bond has two electrons so we have four bonds in this carbon we have eight electrons around this carbon and with this oxygen we have three bonds so we have six electrons plus these two we have eight so now we're going to look for how many electrons is assigned for each atom Okay, so in this case, by using this part of the formula, we need to look for half of the bonding electrons. We have two bonding electrons here. So that means that half of this two is one plus all non-bonding electrons for this oxygen. We have two, four, six plus one is seven. So that's why we are here we have a seven. These are the electrons assigned for this atom. For carbon, basically we have half of bonding electrons. We have just bonding electrons in this carbon. We have eight. Half of them is four. And for this oxygen, we have half of this six electrons is three, and we have two non-bonding electrons. That means we have five. So when we subtract this, is six minus seven is going to be minus one. Six plus five is going to be six minus five is going to be plus one. So that means that this oxygen will have a charge of minus one, a formal charge of minus one, and this one will have a formal charge of positive one. While in this rearrangement, uh, arrangement of ele electrons, all of this has a zero formal charge. So, we saw that we have two different Lewis structures in the slide before. Which one is going to be the dominant? Is the one in which the atoms have formal charges closest to zero or zero, as was in the first one in the left. Puts a negative formal charge on the most electronegative atom also. So in this case, for example, here we have N and CS. We have three different Lewis structure, and all of them are correct in the perspective of the octet rule. But what about the charges? We see here that the most dominant stru structure, three are correct, but there's going to be just one that is dominant. This one is the less dominant because it has numbers uh, larger than zero or different from zero in this two. So here we have just one and one here. Here we have two atoms with different charges uh, or, or a charge different from zero. So this one is not the most dominant. So we have this one and this one. They have a minus one and zero, zero formal charges. They have a zero, zero and minus one charger. So that means that we have basically the same distribution in the um, formal charges, but we need to have that negative in the most electronegative atom that in this case is going to be sulfur okay so this is the most dominant structure uh, for the Lewis structures okay these are correct but this is going to be also the dominant Lewis structure for NCS so one Lewis structure cannot accurately depict a molecule like ozone we use multiple structures known as resonance structure to describe the molecule. This is ozone here. 
and we can see that sometimes we have a multiple bond, double bond between these two oxygens, and sometimes we have the multiple bond between these two oxygen. That means that the electrons have been moving around this area, okay? We have the double bond here, and then we have the double here, the double, that's a resonance, it's called resonance structures. So this is the resonance structure of this structure. That is the distribution of the electrons uh, across the molecule. And here we have one example of benzene. This is a benzene ring. We have the double bond between these two carbons, between these two carbon and these two carbons. And we can see that we can move those double bonds in a way that instead of be here, now they are going to be in other places. They do a resonance structure. This is also the same uh, representation, but with how, without showing the atoms. Okay, but this represents the carbons. Okay, and we don't write the uh, hydrogens in this type of uh, representation, but we still have the double bond between these two carbon, single bond between these two carbon, double bond between these two carbon, single bond between these two carbon. You can see that you have double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, as well as here. Now this double bond moves to this point, this one moves between these two carbon, and this one moves between these two carbon, and we have this structure. And this is happening really, really fast. So we can represent this as this uh, ring with a circle inside, which represent resonance. It means that the electrons are moving all around the molecule, okay? Because we can see that we can move this to here to create this double bond. This double bond move, can move to here to create this one. So it's, they are moving all around the molecule. So this is the organic compound, benzene C6H6, that has those, those two resonance structure. And it's commonly depicted as a high uh, hexagon with a circle inside to signify the localized electrons in the ring. So localized electrons are specifically on one atom or shared between two atoms. So this one is all is a localized electron. They are always between these two carbon. But this one of this is going to be always between these two carbon, but the other one is going to be moving all around the molecule. So we're going to have the localized electrons that are shared by multiple atoms, okay? So those that create those multiple bonds are delocalized because they are moving all around the molecule. Well, for example, also this one is localized. These two electrons are always between these two hydrogen and carbon, these two atoms. Okay, so this, uh, these electrons are localized as well as this one, as well as one of these two double bonds, okay? One of, one of these two, uh, one of these bonds it's going to be moving all the way around the molecule, but the other one is going to stay uh, doing the bond between these two carbons. So one of these is going to be localized, and the other electrons are going to be delocalized. Now, there are some exceptions for the octet rule. There are three types of ions or molecules that do not follow the octet rules. First one, ions are molecules with an odd number of electrons. They are also known as radicals. Ions are molecules with less than an octet, and ions are molecules with more than eight valence electron that is known as the expanded octet. So here we have an example of the odd number of electrons. The relatively rare and unusually quite unstable and reactive, there are ions and molecules with an odd, with an odd number of electrons. Here we have the nitrogen with just one electron here. That means that we're going to have five electrons around this nitrogen. And when we uh, do a resonance structure, or basically a resonance structure of this one, we can create here also a radical, and we have around this oxygen just five electrons. And this is an exception for the octet rule. The other one is when we have fewer than eight electrons, elements in the second period before carbon can make st stable compounds with fewer than eight electrons, as we saw with hydrogen, okay? And also, for example, boron, BF3, BF3 given boron a fill octet place a negative charge on the boron and a positive charge on fluorine. This would not be accurate picture for the distribution of electrons in BF3. So we have here the boron and we can write this uh, uh, structure, Lewis structure for BF3 where each fluorine has basically um, eight electrons. So it has the octet complete while boron still has, still have, is just have six, okay? So we can rewrite to make boron like the octet, to complete that octet, we can do a draw a double bond. We, use, we can use one of these 
uh, on pair, um, pa pair of electrons to create that double bond. But if we do this, each fluorine here with a double bond, each fluorine is going to be a po partial positive. And we know that fluorine is the highest uh, element with the highest electronegativity. So they love electrons. They want to have electrons. They don't want to get rid of electrons. So that's why these are less important, even though they are correctly drawn. But because of that difference in charge, we're going to have an, a positive charge here and a negative charge here. While here, we don't have, we're not going to have any uh, charges. So that's why this one is the dominant structure. The lesson is that if filling the octet of the central atom results in a negative charge on the central atom and a positive charge on the more electronegative outer atom, don't fill the octet of the central atom. It's not going to be favorable. Okay, so that's why in this case, Borum is really happy that we just have less than eight electron, even though it's not uh, an octet. And we also have examples or exceptions with um, um, atoms that could have more than eight electrons. When an element is in the period three or below in the periodic table, period four or five, it can use d orbitals to make more than four bonds. The example is PF5 and also the phosphate. So we can have here the PF5, we have the phosphorus in the middle, and around all the phosphorus we have 10 electrons. It has more than the octet, but because it has d orbitals available, they can use those orbitals to, um, to accept those electrons from the fluorine. This is basically another kind of uh, three-dimensional structure for PF5. And here we have the phosphate. The phosphate here has uh, what basically eight electrons around, okay, and also has a complete octet as well as the oxygen. But as we can see here, we have five charges, a complete of five charges, four negative one and one positive one. While if we can create a double bond between an oxygen and phosphorus, now we're just going to have just three charges. So we are looking for to to to, to look for the structure that has. Uh, the, the less number of charges in each atom. So that's why even though this is a correct one, it completes all the octet, but because phosphorus has a d orbitals also available, we can put those or, uh, electrons in those orbitals and by that way decrease the charges, the partial charges in the molecule so we can have just three instead of five. And even though we're going to still have the ions going to be minus three, okay, but in this case, um, we're going to have a less distribution of charges in the molecule. So this one is uh, predominant over this one. Now let's talk about the uh, covalent bond strength. Most simply, the strength of a bond is measured by determining how much energy is required to break the bond. This is called the bond enthalpy. So the bond enthalpy for chlorine bond, CLCL, is measured to be 242 kilojoules per mole. We write out reaction for breaking one mole of, this, of those bonds. So we can break the bond by saying that we're going to distribute these two electrons, going to give one electron for each side. So we're going to have two radicals of chlorine. And now we talk about the uh, average bond. Enthalpies are positive. Because bond breaking is an endothermic process, you need to add energy. So that's why the enthalpy is going to be positive, so you can break those um, bonds. Note that these are averages over many different compounds. Not every bond in nature for a pair of atoms has exactly the same bond energy. So that means that not all of the carbon-carbon single bond, you need to add three, four, uh, 348 kilojoules. Sometimes you need to add a little bit more or a little bit less. This is just an average because those those bonds could be in different molecules and dif because different molecules they can have a little bit the different uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the strength of that of that bond. But the average is going to be for example 348. So what do you think is going to be the average bond enthalpy for a double bond of carbon carbon? It's going to be higher or lower? It's going to be higher because we, now we need to grow to break two uh, two bonds between those carbons, so that's what we can see here that the average uh, bond enthalpy for the double bond is 614 kilojoules per mole, while for the triple bond, 
is 839 kilojoules per mole. So as higher the uh, multi uh, the multiplicity of those or the, uh, bonds, you're gonna have also a higher average of bond enthalpy. You need more energy to break those multiple bonds. So using bond enthalpy to estimate the enthalpy of a reaction. Now we know that the enthalpy of a reaction is the energy that may be required or will be released when you're doing a reaction, okay? So we can calculate that energy of the reaction by knowing the enthalpy of the bonds. So one way to estimate the delta H for a reaction is to use the bond enthalpies of bonds broken and the new bonds form. So energy is added to break bonds and release when making bonds. So we're gonna always we're gonna add energy so we can broke those bonds, but when we create bonds, we're gonna release energy. So in other words, the delta H of the reaction is gonna be equal to the sum of the bond enthalpy for all bonds broken minus the sum of the bond enthalpies of all bonds formed. Okay, so here, for example, we have methane and we have chlorine. So here we're, so as, as we can see at this point, we broke one bond between a carbon and a hydrogen, so that's why we have a hydrogen here, and the CH3 now is, before was CH4, but now we remove one hydrogen, we have the CH3. To do that, we need to add energy. We need to add energy to break this bond. The same thing happens with the chlorine, with the Cl2. We, to create this two radicals here, we need to break this bond and we need to add energy. Now, when we create the bonds between this chlorine and this hydrogen, and this chlorine and this carbon, energy is released. And we can see here that actually the, the products has less energy than the reactant. So that means that that was an exothermic kind of reaction because it released more energy than the one that you used to broke the bonds to create these radicals. So from the figure on the last slide, we have that, okay, there's a methane and the chlorine producing the chlorine uh, methane and the HCl. In this example, one carbon hydrogen bond and one chlorine CLC bond are broken, one from here, one from here, and one carbon chlorine and one HCl bonds are formed. We form with one of this chlorine uh, bond to one of the carbon and the hydrogen was released, bond with the other chlorine. So now, we need to look for the enthalpy for each of the bonds, okay? And that's in the table. Here we have 413 kilojoules. And here we have 242 kilojoules for the chlorine chlorine bond. So this is the energy that's required to uh, break those bonds. Minus, then we look for the uh, enthalpy for each of the chlorine that was formed. So it's going to be 328 kilojoules for carbon chlorine and 431 kilojoules for hydrogen chlorine. And that means that we have 655 kilojoules minus 759 kilojoules. And we see here that the reaction is an exothermic one. It released energy. This is uh, agree with the figure that we saw before, where we saw that the products has lower energy than the reactant. And in this way, we can calculate the enthalpy of a reaction. Remember that will be the sum of the enthalpies of the uh, broken bonds minus the enthalpy of the formed bonds. Also, we can relate the bond enthalpy and the bond length. We can also measure an average bond length for different bond types. As the number of bonds between the two atoms increases, the bond length decrease. Okay, so the single bond between carbon and carbon is going to be longer than the double bond between carbon and carbon. Here, this is the bond length. We can see that the bond length for the carbon carbon single bond is going to be 1.54 Armstrong while the double bond carbon-carbon is 1.34 Armstrong and the triple bond is 1.20 Armstrong. So as higher the uh, number of bonds that you're going to have between atoms, you're going to have, uh, they're gonna, the length is going to be smaller for that multiple bond. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if we have the same kind of elements or different elements, it's going to be always the same uh, tr trend. And with that, we finish a chapter 8 basic concept of chemical bonding.